Let us pray. Most heavenly and gracious Father, we're so thankful and grateful as we gather together around your word. We seek your wisdom and your way that we will do all according to your will. Lord, as we approach you at the throne of grace, we also lift up those who may be suffering, who may be ill, who may be diseased, who may be in any harm's way. And we pray that first and foremost, you would be the great healer who brings healing, for you are the great physician. For those who are troubled in despair, depression, or grief, we trust that you will be the great counselor who brings comfort from your word. And for those who've lost their way or are enslaved in sin's darkness, may you shine your love through bringing the light of your countenance upon them, breaking the chains by your grace, loving them through the gospel of Jesus Christ so that they may know you as the captain of their salvation and the shepherd of their souls. Bless our time together in your word. We pray this in the name of all names and all God's children say together, Amen. We're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 18, which has the line, where the spirit of the Lord is, liberty. There is an old spiritual, which was a song that was sung by African Americans back in the 19th century, the song was called Free at Last. You are familiar with the chorus because it's in Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous I Have a Dream speech. Now the chorus goes, free at last, free at last, thank God, I'm free at last. But there's three stanzas to this hymn. It goes like this, way down yonder in the graveyard walk, I thank God I'm free at last. Me and my Jesus going to meet and talk. I thank God I'm free at last. On my knees when the light passed by, I thank God I'm free at last. Thought my soul would rise and fly. I thank God I'm free at last. Some of these mornings bright and fair, I thank God I'm free at last. Going to meet King Jesus in the air. I thank God I'm free at last. Free at last. Free at last. I thank God I'm free at last. A simple song with eternal truths. What are we free from, you might ask? Well, first, the power of sin. Second, from the power and the influence of the prince of the air, Satan. And thirdly, when we arrive in heaven, we will be free from the presence of sin. In verse 17, we find this truth. Now, the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Liberty is freedom from another power. We turn to the second letter of Paul, who wrote the church in Corinth. They were dealing with issues of who to follow, false doctrines, grave sin in the camp, and the one true gospel. Critics of Paul were in competition for souls. They thought it as a business. So they tried to declare him as illegitimate. Some even said that his teaching was false. Some were trying, trying to, to get the, these new believers back into the Jewish camp, the Judaizers. Now they believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but they thought that and believed that the old law was still in force. So Paul points to the mission work that he and his team performed in the church, what happened there. And this church was a witness to the power of the gospel and the Holy Spirit in their lives. In verse 12 of chapter 3, Paul writes, Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And he explains what the law could not do. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end that of which is abolished. So Paul reminds them of what happened in Exodus, in Exodus chapter 34, Moses had been with God, he had received the law. He had been in the presence of God and lived. That's what's wonderful about this. Let me read that portion from Exodus 34, starting in verse 29. And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount that, 
Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. Now, this was the second time Moses came down from the mountain. The first time he came down with the law, there was sin in the camp, and it had to be purged. The law was not given. In fact, Moses broke the tablets and just threw them down. They broke. He had to go back and get a second set. The people had become lawless. They broke the Ten Commandments before it could be given. That's the sinful nature of man. The law for its own goodness, Paul will explain, cannot reveal glory clearly to sinful men. So what is glory? It is giving God what is due him. It is giving honor and respect. And our sinful nature reacts against the law. It's just the way we are. We have that common proverb we used to say when I was a kid that rules were made to be broken. It's in our sinful nature not to respect the law. Now, laws are necessary for life and good order. We have to realize that. Whether or not you believe in God, it is a good thing that murder is recognized as a crime and as an evil. So it is against the law to murder your neighbor, your brother, your sister, your father, your mother, or, or even the stranger. That's the fact of life. It's against the law. Wherever you go, murder is murder. It's a crime. Theft, stealing, is against the law. Because we believe in property rights. What we own, what we work for, what we created is ours. Whether it's a song we wrote, a book we wrote, a house we built, a house we bought, a car we own, if they get become stolen, it's a crime. Our property is ours to use to support ourselves, and if we choose, we can use it to help others. It also keeps peace in the community. You don't want to live in a village of thieves. Of all the Ten Commandments, the last one is not the least. Thou shalt not covet. Because coveting is always the first step towards the breaking of the other commandments. Now Moses wore a veil to cover his shining face, which reflected God's glory. Moses was a hint of what God intended for mankind, to reflect his glory. The law has consequences. When there is a focus only on a law, then sins becomes a barrier and law cannot reveal grace. If you go back to Exodus 19, you have the meeting of Moses and the people of Israel. And God laid out a challenge. Verse 4, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So Moses was told by God, speak this to Israel. And it was a test. So Moses called the people together. And he repeated God's word to them. They answered, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord in Exodus 19, verses 7 and 8. Now, on the surface, it looks all well and good. You see, well, I don't see a problem with this, Pastor. Well, it was easy for them to say, we will do. What would have happened if they had said, let us pray on this? Let us spend time in prayer. Did they really reflect on themselves? Did they truly grasp God's grace and why they were there free from Egyptian bondage? And of course, some grumbled along the way. They were at that meeting by God's grace. They had to have to admit that they were sinners. And they had their moment. There was a moment when the sea was before them and the Egyptian army was bearing on them and they were thinking, Who, what should we do first? Drown Moses or throw him off a cliff? He got us in this mess. How are we going to get out? They complained to him. They complained about God. Yet God moved in his grace, parted the sea. They crossed over. 
Then they had a worship service. They sang. They saw the Egyptian army drown. They were in good spirits. Only God's hands holding back the sea long enough for them to escape was would do. And it was by his grace. He didn't have to save them, but he did. Only God's hands would release the sea to drown the army of destruction. Had they been more thoughtful, prayerful, and honest, this is what they should have said. Lord, as much as we want to or desire, we are incapable, for we are sinners. We cannot do this without your help, without your grace and your mercy. Israel could not look beyond the veil of the law which hid the glory of God and the wonders of his grace. And Paul uses the law as a teaching device. He's not against the law. It's a wonderful thing because it comes from God. It's God's word. It's the law that reveals to us our sin, our sins, and sinful nature. The law is like a veil, as Paul writes, and not as Moses would put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds are blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. So this veil, this darkness of their spirit, this mask, they could not see the grace behind the law. The law is like a veil. The inner mind of the unbeliever is a darkened mind. Sin has callous mankind to evil. Paul reminds the believer of what the Lord did. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Again, we keep it simple. The gospel is no secret. The Bible is available to those who want to read it, the Gospels declare, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, declare how Jesus Christ fulfilled the law, how he went to the cross and died for our sins, how he fulfilled the law. So we could, so he even did, with his death on the cross, he removed the barrier. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they record the same event of the temple curtain being torn in two the moment Jesus died. Matthew 27, 50, and Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain, torn in two, from top to the bottom. Now, got to remember, this was a particular veil, particular curtain that's very high, very tall, very long, however you want to describe it. You know, it's like 15 feet tall or something to that effect. And it was a barrier to the opening into the small room called the Holiest of Holies where sat the Ark of the Covenant. The lid was called the mercy seat. Inside that box was a pot of manna, the rod of Aaron that budded, and also the ta two tablets of the law. Now all of these objects inside, in fact, even the mercy seat point to Jesus Christ by way, but that's another sermon. And only once a year, the high priest would take a special offering, and he had a special cup at a point at the end, so he couldn't set it down. As soon as the sacrifice was made of the red heifer, he'd take the blood, go in, and he would sprinkle the mercy seat with the blood. And that was the place. It, it, this was a picture of Jesus Christ, the mercy seat. When Jesus shed his blood, he died because God's grace and mercy and love for you and me. All this was a symbolic action that points to the work of Jesus Christ, who shed blood would release us from the penalty of sin. So in the moment he died and said, it is finished, God literally, it's as if God grabbed the curtain at the top and just tore it in two. The veil was removed. 
Paul writes, but their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is turned away. So, I, 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 this is what happens when we come to Christ. That veil, that, that barrier is removed. So this, this explains why a lot of people still live in sin's darkness. They will not turn to the Lord. Hardened hearts do not see the truth. And sin is that veil that keeps them in darkness. The Lord did something else for us. He freed us from sin's bondage. He came to release the prisoners. Now, Paul speaks of his own experience. He was a Pharisee. He was trained in the law in the Old Testament. He loved the law, but he discovered he was a prisoner to sin. In Romans chapter 7, starting verse 23, but I see another law in my members, talking about his body, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So he talks about, he now has the mind of Christ, but we still have that old sinful nature. And there's this battle that goes on. This is why sometimes Christians sin. We allow the old man, the old person, the old woman, rise up. This is why Paul says you need to mortify your flesh daily. You need to strive to be in Christ. Now, the saints of the old covenant were waiting for Jesus to release them from their holding place. This is the other aspect about the prisoners. See, God realized no one could come into the presence of God until the wages of sin was paid. So when the faithful died, they went to a holding place they called Abraham's bosom or paradise. So when Jesus died between the, those three days when he was absent, in a sense, before his resurrection, he appeared in that holy place, holding place, and he led captivity captive, as Paul describes it in Ephesians 4 9. When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. So he took the first group of saints to be in the presence of the Father. The rest of us to be absent from the body is present with the Lord. And then we also have the giving of the Holy Spirit. Jesus prayed to the Father that he would send his Holy Spirit. And this is what, we're in, we're in this age of the church, the age of grace right now. And the Holy Spirit is a key component of that. And he comes to convict of sin. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. In John 16, 8. So, this is vital. You are not alone when you share the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is there with you in that moment. As we witness, he empowers the words we speak. And as we witness and share our testimony, he convicts the heart of the listening sinner. We find an example of this in the book of Acts, and where you have the conversion of the Philippian jailer. There was an earthquake. He thought all the prisoners were gone. His life depended upon them being kept in prison. He knew his life would be taken if they escaped, so he's going to commit suicide, which was the honorable thing to do. And Paul and Silas called out and said, we're still here. And he was so convicted, because remember, Paul and Silas were singing hymns and praying and having a worship service in jail. He may have heard them singing. He came under conviction. Sirs, what must I do to be saved in Acts 16, verse 30? So this leads to the conversion of the soul. This is what the Holy Spirit does. Paul's first letter to the church, he writes about spiritual gifts. Now, he said he preferred the gift of prophecy over speaking in tongues when no interpreter was present. Now, prophecy is not fortune-telling. Prophecy is not someone coming along and says, I have the gift of prophet, and I see that you are doing such and such. Or there's sin in your life, because I can see it. God has spoken to me. I have been given a word from the Lord that you have done such and such. No. Old Testament, New Testament, prophecy is simply speaking forth God's word to God's people. They were watchmen. When they would see that God's people would start to stray, they would use God's word to correct them. Today, we would say that it's mainly preaching and teaching and witnessing. The Bible is inspired. The Holy Spirit moves us. I'm going to use a different translation to read from 1 Corinthians 14, verses 24 and 25. 
called God's Word. Now suppose you speak what God has revealed. When unbelievers or outsiders come in, you will show them where they are wrong and convince them that they are sinners. The secrets in their hearts will become known, and in this way they will quickly bow down with their faces touching the ground, worship God, and confess that God is truly among you. That's how prophecy works. You speak God's word, whether it's an unbeliever or a believer, and the, the sin that's made known is going to be made known in their mind. They're going to know and take responsibility. You know, when we lead someone to Christ, the first thing we have to get them to admit is that they're a sinner. One of the teaching tools I use in witnessing someone is to use the Ten Commandments, by the way. One of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not lie. Have you ever told a lie? Now, they have to tell the truth. Some say, well, I told a white lie. Well, I say, white lie is still a, a lie. Another one is, uh, thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus took it further and said that if you have lust for another person, if you're a man who lusts after other women, you've already committed adultery in their heart. And then you apply it to the person you're speaking to. Have you ever lusted for someone else? Now, if they say no, I said, well, there's another commandment, thou shalt not lie. Did you just lie to me? My favorite, though, is honor your mother and father. Have you honored your mother and father 100% of the time? We're using the law. And they know that they sin. The Holy Spirit has promised to indwell us, to pray on our behalf, and to conform the saints. So we live in this wonderful time because we have been free to live for Christ. We have this Holy Spirit who convicts our heart of sin. And we do sometimes sin as Christians. But we're allowed to confess our sins. And God... It says in the, in the book of James, he is faithful and just to cleanse us of all our sins if we confess them. And we need the Spirit's help. The Holy Spirit is our teacher, the Spirit of truth. He's the wisdom that James speaks of in his letter to the church. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceful, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy, James 3.17. So he conforms us to Christ-like character, conduct, and conversation. He gives us his manifestation so that, that, that it's reproduced in our lives. And love, joy, gentleness, and so on and so forth. We call them the fruits of the Spirit. We manifest that. As we strive to abide in Christ, we take more of him in us. And so we can reflect it to the world. We have been freed from sin so we can be conformed to Christ. This is what Paul brings it down to. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, keeping the law is difficult for a sinful person. It only reveals our failing sinful nature. And the law could not reveal God's grace and glory to those who are kept in sin. Sin keeps us in darkness. Jesus Christ was the only one who could fulfill God's word, the only one who could fulfill the law. And the wages of sin was paid in full at the cross with the shed blood of Jesus Christ. This opens the way into God's presence. This releases the Holy Spirit to come into us. And when we are convicted and we receive Christ as Savior, then we are free from the bondage of sin. This allows us to be back in God's original plan to reflect his glory and to be used by him to reach out to a lost and dying world. Let us pray. Father, we're so thankful and grateful for today's lesson from your word. May we take this gift of salvation and use it for your glory. May we not take it lightly, but use it to its full potential. May we truly Live and act as if we're free from the entanglements of this world, living for Jesus Christ. Father, should someone not know Christ today, may today be the day of their salvation because the gospel is simple. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for our sins according to Scripture, was buried and risen from the third day. And he was witnessed by over 500 eyewitnesses. Father, we thank you for the work of your Son in our lives. We thank you that you would move the Holy Spirit to convict the lives of whoever has listening and has yet to trust in Christ, may they make that full admission that they are sinners. May they believe that Jesus Christ did in fact 
make the payment for their sins and has risen from the dead. And may they confess that in prayer. And you will come into their lives, saving them, forgiving them, and walk with them from here into eternity. Bless us as we go to the conclusion of the service today and all God's children say together. Be good and be blessed to those who are listening today.